right, guys, let's get started with Resol Foundation's 2019 Financial Awareness Seminar. Our first guest speaker is Anthony Sindone. He is a Clinical Assistant Professor of Finance and Economic Development at Purdue University Northwest. Professor Tony has more than 31 years of experience in research and consulting, including forensic economics, labor markets, workforce development, public policy, housing markets, and regional economic development. He is a member of the Regional Council of Economic Advisors for Northwest Indiana and serves several regional workforce and economic development boards. Welcome, Anthony Sindone. many young people in this audience. Here's what we know, and this is what the, the catalyst of my speaking on this has been for the last several years. I know that about 47% of the people in this country can't come up with 400 bucks to pay for an emergency. What's the thing about what that means? $400. Your car breaks down. First of all, it's hard to get away with less than $1,000 if your car breaks down, right, these days? 400 bucks might pay for a couple of tires if they go flat. And so what happens if you can't come up with $400? What do people do? They borrow, exactly. They borrow money and pay interest on that. And then they're, they, can, they dig themselves deeper and deeper into the hole. So we need to work on that a little bit. We also know that four out of five working households have retirement savings of less than one year's salary. So how many years do you expect to live after retirement? One? <laughs> no, I don't think so, right? <laughs> I'm going to live to be up uh, 200, so that's not, uh, that's not an option for me, right? I want to try to build up some kind of retirement saving uh, and assets so that I can live a relatively comfortable life uh, at least until I'm 150. So here's something that's eye-opening too, something you may or may not know. The average credit card balance in the state of Indiana is $6,958. Now, some of you might say, well, it's not a big deal. $6,000, right? I have $30,000, $50,000, $110,000 of student loans. What is $6,000? Well, by the way, we're ranked 34th in the country. Um, so we're not the worst. Uh, Illinois, by the way, is above us at 7278 Okay, here in Indiana, but here's something that's kind of interesting. Let me ask you a question. If we make the minimum payments on a, on a credit card balance of $69.58, minimum payments is generally 2% of the balance. If you look at your credit card statement, oh, nobody looks at that. You know what people do? They don't look at their statement, they just look at how much do I have to pay every month, right? That's what they do. They say, oh, I have to pay, you know, so much a month, I'm going to pay that, and, and I'm good. And I'll just, oh, I have room left on my car. And if I don't have enough room on that car, I'll get another car. So I, I have more room, right? People have that mindset. You need to change that. Look, 2% balance, 2% uh, of the balance of about $6,900 is about $140 a month. The average interest on credit cards is 19.24% interest. Okay? How long do you think it would take for you to pay this off? Anybody want to take a guess? And that's if you didn't add anything more to it. Okay, how long do you think it would take? Seven years. Thirty. Thirty. Would you say seven? Yeah. Actually, you're pretty close. About eight and a third years. That's if you diligently pay the 140 bucks mm -hmm. and you only pay two percent of the balance. It the math, right? One hundred months it would take you eight and a third years to pay off the sixty-nine hundred dollar balance. And think about what you could do with that hundred and forty dollars a month if you didn't maintain a credit card balance. Your total payments would be fourteen thousand thirty-eight dollars, by the way. So you're paying, you know, more than seven thousand dollars for a four thousand for a six thousand dollars. Think about that. All right? So keep in mind now, am I against credit cards completely? No, I'm not. Credit cards are a very useful tool if you use them as a tool. Okay? And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Yeah, I say yikes. This is horrible, right? Absolutely. I, you know, don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. Yikes. Okay. So I said before that finance is very personal. Now, I'm going to say something that some of you might have known before, and that is it is not usually 
the lack of finances that causes divorce, but a lack of compatibility in the financial arena. Now, why am I focusing on divorce? Number one cause of divorce by many studies is not necessarily lack of money, not necessarily lack of financial acumen. A lot of it has to do with not being able to communicate each, with each other about your money. That's what we see. Poor communication. No savings. I just got done saying about 47% of people don't have 400 bucks. Right? Money secrets. Oh, this is a big one. Money secrets. So often spouses don't talk to each other about money. They don't talk to each other about everything else. About the kids. They might even talk to each other about Infidelity. Right? They might. Before they talk about money. We see this. We see this time and time again. Now, this is not a seminar on relationships, okay? <laughs> but money and relationships go hand in hand. You, how many people do you think? I mean, you might know of some, there's so many young people in this audience. Gosh, everybody's younger than me. <laughs> so many young people in this audience, right? Well, as they're getting ready to get married, one of the first things that they should do is probably talk about their finances. Very few people do, right? And, and it's, by the way, I blame guys, mostly, right? Because we don't like to admit how little money we have and how little knowledge we have about money, right? They say, oh, look at, I'm spend look at all the money I'm spending on you, right? And I'm, like, I'm really rich, this is great. I'm going to take you to New York, I'll take you to Paris, never mind, I'm running up debt to do it. And then you get married, and then what happens? Couples tend to hide their money problems from each other. We actually call that financial infidelity. Okay? So, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because, as I said before, finance is personal. And you have to be open, even you have to be honest with yourself about your money. We lie to ourselves about our money. We do. We say we think we have a whole lot more than we do. We think we have a whole lot more prospects in the future than we really do. I, and I'm a positive guy. I like to think that yeah, things in the future are going to be great. Okay? But the reality is, maybe they won't be. So we have to prepare for those situations where they're not. So how do we do that? Oh, notice the last bullet I put up here too. Uh, one of the big problems that people have in their relationships uh, is that they have different money values. Uh, for example, you might have two people to get together uh, and they're both savers, okay? So they both have compatible money values, they both save. Or they're both spenders. Well, I would argue against both being spenders because then you're wondering where all the money went, okay? Uh, but at least you're compatible. You know what we see most often? One's a saver, one's a spender. You know what happens? The spender hides their spending. They do, right? They say, well, I, you know, am I buying a latte every day? No. No, I don't buy lattes every day. How much money do you have? Well, you know, and, and, and they, just, they don't say anything, right? How much money do you have in your pocket? Uh, why'd you pull $5,000 out of the bank? Oh, the bank made a mistake. The bank did not make a mistake, okay? Different money values causes many problems. So what should you do, right? So what attitude should you have going forward? Like I said, I'm not giving legal advice or tax advice. We have a wonderful tax expert that's going to be talking about tax a little bit later. Uh, but here's what I like to talk about today. I'm going to take a look at what I call my, my top five personal finance rules. And then I'm going to talk about investment. Because these rules are primarily saving type of rules, okay? So my top five. Number one, and this is number one, okay? The rest of them don't have to be put in particular order, but this is number one. Keep a journal of all your spending for three months. I'll say that again. Keep a journal and be honest with that journal, okay? You write down every single dime you spend and where you spend it. And you don't have to show it to anybody right away, because I'm going to tell you what will happen. After you do this, you're going to, you're going to show it. If you have a partner, a life partner, right? You're going to show that to them and say, look, we're, we're spending our money, right? And what do we have to show for it after three months? By the way, the reason I say three months instead of one month, I know a lot of my colleagues will say, yeah, I'll give a journal for one month. 
Well, you know, things come up. You got holidays, birthdays, anniversaries, all that stuff, right? That adds to it, right? And you'll say, well, this month, maybe it's a slow month. Maybe March is a slow month. Look how little I'm spending in March. But then in April, you have two birthdays, and you've got, uh, uh, you know, your, your kids are graduating from high school. You have that going on, right? That sorts of things. Keep that journal because for three months, because then you multiply that by four, you kind of annualize everything, right? Then you divide by 12. This is your average monthly expenditure, okay? That'd be a way of doing it. Some people say keep it six months. I say three months because one month is too short. Six months is way too long. People are not that disciplined, right? But three months, we can do this. You would be surprised what you spend your money on. You would be shocked what you spend your money on. Now, I don't, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, okay? But think about this to yourself. How many of us buy a $4 latte at Starbucks, not going to get Starbucks, but a $4 latte at least three times a week, right? We do that. I did the math here, right? If you do that, $4 a, uh, a day for three, for three times a week, 52 weeks a year, you do a little arithmetic, I put, and if you put that money instead of into lattes, you put that into something I'm going to talk about later on, uh, an index fund, a uh, standard board, the average return is a 9.8%. I know I'm going to, now I'm going to glaze people's eyes over here in a second, right? But the bottom line is, just those $4 a day, at the end of 30 years, and I know you don't want to think about 30 years, but at the end of 30 years, you'll have an additional $62,000. Could you deal with $62,000 when you reach the age of 50? I see some 20 year olds in here. Wouldn't that be nice to have $62,000 in the bank? No, I said nothing against buying a latte, nothing against buying things that make you happy. That's fine. It's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of do you want $62,000 in the future or do you want to have a little, little shot of espresso with a whole bunch of foam <laughs> three days a week? Right? I get that. Well, think about that. Think about this. Now, you were talking about, you know, back when we were kids or younger, right? Saying uh, a cup of coffee used to cost a, a quarter, right? A cup of coffee, a quarter, and you got a full cup of coffee, right? Now, you're buying a $4 latte, okay? It's got this much coffee in it, and the rest of it's foamed milk. But we said, well, I'm going to have my $4 latte. <laughs> right? That's what we do. It's, it's an event. You ever watch people buy... Buy things from Starbucks and, and, and all these other coffee shops. It's an event. People come in with a with I think they have a script. They'll walk up there and say, Well, I'll have a frappe caramel macchiato with uh, with salt and and, and, and and chocolate and all that. It's like, I want a cup of coffee. Okay, there you go. Four bucks. You'll be surprised where the opportunities would be to save more if you keep yourself, keep a journal, and continue this. Right after the three month period, you would be shocked and you'll say, We don't need this, we don't need that. Let's put that money someplace else. Number two, save something every time you get a paycheck or receive some revenue. Save something. I I can almost guarantee that a large number of people in this room decide that they're going to save money after they pay their bills. Or they'll decide, they'll they'll have this vision that that's what they're going to do. Right? They'll say, well, I have to pay my bills first, and then I'm going to, whatever's left over, I'll save some of that. Okay? Most people don't do that. So here's what I say. Save up front. Pay yourself first. I know you've heard of that expression before. Pay yourself first, but it works. Right? Now, you don't have to save a lot of money initially, and I know a lot of young people here, it's tough to save, isn't it? it I'm, I'm seeing... Face it, heads not. Yeah, it's tough to say. Why is it tough to say? I don't make a lot of money. Okay? Well, of course. No, when you're young, generally you don't make a lot of money. Okay? Even when you're older, you don't make a lot of money. But I'll tell you something. I know people that are making half a million dollars a year, they have zero saving. Because they never got into the habit of saving. Saving is a habit. This is why I'm saying, you know, start small. Start with, let's say, come up with 2%, maybe, of your paycheck. Right? So if you make $100, you put two bucks away. You live on the other $98. That's the way to do it. Notice, I'm saying that the goal here is to what I call warehousing money. Okay? Just put it aside. 
Make it a habit. Every time you receive some money. How many of us get found money once in a while, right? Get found money, right? What does that mean, found money? Well, I didn't expect this money to come in. Uh, and what am I going to do with it? I didn't know I had it. How do you know you didn't have any money? You ever find a $20 bill in a dryer? That's the money you put away. How many of us think, oh, it's found money? It's not mine. It's my partner's money. That's okay. <laughs> right? right? And, and yeah, by the way, you're not going to tell your partner you're found the 20 bucks. Right? Yeah, exactly. That is that financial infidelity thing I was talking about before, right? So you take the $20 and you say, oh, this is good. I can now buy X, whatever it is, right? Why don't you take that $20 and just put some of it away? Forget about it. That's a Jersey term. Forget about it. From okay. Yeah. It makes no sense, by the way, because I am going to talk about investing. It makes no sense to talk about investing or accruing more debt without having some cash available for an emergency. That's what you have to do first. Build your cash reserves. And then you can talk about investing beyond having about, I like to say, have at least three months of expenses in the bank. Now, how do you know what the three months expenses are? Remember that journal I had you write? There's your three months expenses. You save until you get that and then you forget about it until you need it. Okay? In fact, a lot of us, I, I like six months, but six months is onerous. I was told by my colleagues, you'll never get people to save six months. I said, I'm not getting people to do anything. I'm just making a suggestion. Okay? So I suggest that Keep putting money. If you have three months worth of uh, expenses in the bank, then you start and paying down your credit. We'll talk about that. Then you're ready to invest. Then you're ready to grow your liquid assets. Pay yourself first. Make saving a habit. Live below your means. This is rule number three, right? And I admit this is a tough sell. Why is it a tough sell? We're Americans. We deserve whatever it is we get. Right? We are bombarded with marketing materials that try to tell us one way or another, you'll feel better if you buy this stuff. Right? That's what we get all the time. We deserve to live beyond our means. Why do you think they're throwing credit card applications to you or anything all that stuff, right? You deserve this. By the way, the last housing crisis, right, back in 2007, 2008, the, the beginning of all that, now that's a different seminar, by the way. I have an actual, actual presentation of the, of the causes of the financial crisis in 07 08. We can talk about that later, okay? <laughs> but the beginning of that was in the 1970s. A lot of people don't realize that. There were a lot of, a lot of things that were put in, in place, uh, mostly to make banks money. And that's what it was. We got people to pay off their credit cards by offering home equity lines of credit. So we did. And we said, pay off your credit cards. But we also knew you weren't going to pay off your credit cards. So then you run your credit cards back up again. You have the home equity line of credit based on somebody's opinion of what the house is worth. Okay? Then you say, well, how else can we make money? They've already maximized their credit cards. They've maximized the so-called equity in their house. What are we going to do? I know. We'll refinance. We'll help them refinance their house. And we'll refinance using something called the adjustable rate mortgage. And the adjustable rate mortgage did what? Didn't even cover the real mortgage. Didn't really cover the, the real interest rate on that house. Long story short, people finally realized they can't pay the full freight on those houses. People walked away. The rest is history. That, that was the catalyst of the Great Recession. That we're, we're just, in my opinion, over the last two years, now starting to really see a recovery. That's how long it takes, about eight, nine years to recover from a recessionary period that was so devastating. So how do you avoid that? Uh, I, I have a good friend of mine who is a, uh, a contractor, and uh, I'll never forget something that he had said, and, and, and this phrase stuck in, in my mind. He uh, called his guys together, and uh, you know, business was down for them, but they went, they made a concerted effort to increase their business, and the line he said to his employees was, I'm not participating in this recession. Think about that. That's a great attitude, isn't it? I'm not participating in this recession. How can you not participate in a recession? You do that is by building a little bit of a nest egg. So you have some cushion there. You're going to lose your job. It's going to take you six months to find another one. I'm telling you, that's what it's going to take. 
People say, well, I lost my job, I'll find a job tomorrow. Uh, maybe. I hope it works out that way for you. It's Okay. So anyway, pay yourself first, live below your means, and if you pay yourself first, by the way, by definition, now you're living below your means, right? Pay yourself first, put it away, then live on the rest. Use automation as much as you can. Put the money away and even pay your bills before you even see your paycheck. I'm a big fan of that. Where, uh, you know, I, I have money coming, coming out of my account, just going into a, into, well, now into an investment account, because I've, I've done the three month savings thing, right? And I've, I've, I have zero uh, consumer uh, debt right now. It took a while to do it, guys. It's not, not easy. I'm not saying it's easy, okay? But I have money going directly into an invest, a couple of investment accounts. Because I'm ready, remember, I'm going to live to um, 200, so I need to really sock it away uh, so that my wife and I can live a, a pretty decent retirement. You can also do that to pay your bills. The, high, the idea too, by the way, this last line is very important. Develop the discipline to track the cash flows every month. Track your cash flows. Again, keeping your journal. Work with your life partner about keeping the journal. By the way, it gets easier every single month you do it. Okay? The first month is tough. The first month, I'm going to tell you, I hope, hope I'm wrong. But the first month, you're going to say, well, oh, I, I forgot this receipt, or I forgot to write this down, or I forgot to do this, I forgot to do that. Or I really don't want him to know I did this. I don't really want her to know I did this, right? I'll just kind of add it next month, that kind of thing. It gets easier as you move forward, especially if you and your, your partner, or even if you're by yourself, you have to be honest with yourself, right? You or your partner get together, and look at these things together. It will actually add to your intimacy. Like I said, it's not a relationship at <laughs> seven bar, but it does. It works. Trust me. Now, does that mean I said before? Am I uh, am I totally against credit cards? No, I'm not. I'm really not. Uh, I'm not against credit, but I'm also against abuse of credit. Okay, but I'm all for good credit. So credit is important. Establishing good credit will lower your cost of a mortgage or a car loan, that sort of thing. If you have a terrible credit score, uh, oh, they'll lend you money, but the interest would be extremely high on that, and you're overpaying, really, for whatever it is that you that you want to buy. Now, I'm not a big fan of even car loans. Anybody in this audience in the car business? Good. I'm not a big fan of car loans, okay? Because, look, you're, you're paying interest on a depreciating asset. The moment you, you, you drive a car off the lot, the value of that car is going down by at least 30% in the first couple of days. Think about that. And then you're paying interest on a loan. I've seen car loans out as long as seven years. Okay? You're paying seven years on a car that probably doesn't have a lifespan more than five years before a major repair. Okay? So if you're going to take a car loan, I understand that you, you want to you know, get a, a nice car that's reliable. You, not that not many people have that kind of cash laying around. Um, by the way, I learned just recently the average car loan, and that's for the smallest cars in addition to the most expensive cars, the average car loan now is over $900 a month. $900 a month. Yikes. Okay. Now, I know what you, you might be thinking. You say, well, my car loan's only $200. My car loan's $150. Well, that's good. Yeah, good for you. Uh, but uh, is there any need really to buy a $75,000 SUV? My house, when I bought it, wasn't $75,000, okay? And so, I don't know. But if, that, if that's what floats your boat, then, then fine. But keep in mind that this is all part of your own financial infrastructure, okay? Try to keep the car loan balance as low as possible. Save for that down payment, as big a down payment as you can. You should, be, you should be paying for half the car before you buy the car, okay? That's how much money, and how are you gonna do that? Pay yourself first, that's how you do it, right? Okay, by the way, uh, there are a lot of people that do apply for lots of credit cards, right? Uh, and they say, well, I'm gonna keep doing it. Look at all these credit cards I have. I have 12 credit cards in my wallet, it's great. Yeah, there's a commercial out there, you know, what's in your wallet? Okay. 
Well, it's not a bad idea to have a credit card, okay, for emergencies and, and rent cars. If you need to rent cars here and there, that's fine. Pay off the balance, by the way. The old school way used to be, we used to say that uh, maintain about a 30% balance on your credit card. Now the credit scoring system is changing. We're now saying pay off the credit card as quickly as you can. If you can pay it off every month, that's great. But pay it off as quickly as you can, that actually raises your credit score. Because one of the, one of the items that, that we look at in credit scores is available credit. The more available credit you have, the higher the credit score will be. Therefore, if you do take out a loan, the lower the interest rate will tend to be for that loan. Incidentally, if you are turned down for cards, it's a double win, right? One, you're disappointed. Well, they didn't give you a credit card. But the second thing would be your credit score will go down too because it's what we call a hard inquiry, meaning some, you know, a bank is now checking out your credit. That will, you'll get a hit on your um, uh, on your credit score, and then you'll take a double hit because you were turned down for that credit card. And now that's that's uh, broadcasting to the rest of the financial industry that maybe he or she's not credit worthy anymore, right? So that's where your credit score goes down. That credit score, by the way, is nothing more than an indicator of how good a credit customer you will be. Okay? The higher the credit score, that means the more likely you are going to take loans out. In the from the financial industry, and the more likely you are to pay that to pay that off, or at least to make the payments. So these are my top five rules in personal finance. Notice we started with saving. Well, being honest with yourself, right? So write down the um, uh, keep a journal, saving, pay yourself first, live below your means, and of course, finally, use credit wisely.